Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Quiet, numbskulls, I'm broadcasting. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it, stick it out of it, sells, all right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. In the studio with us today here in Nashville, Tennessee. Hailing from the foothills of North Georgia's Appalachian Mountains, Charles E. Etheridge, roots in Americana music, run very deep from what I read. She learned to sing harmony around your grandmother's piano after church on Sundays and taught yourself guitar from your mother's old Emmy Lou Harris song book, which, by the way, I used to have one of those. <laughs> she wrote her first song at the age of seven while riding through the woods in her stepdad's old army jeep. After moving to Nashville in 2003, Charles E. was immersed into the Nashville songwriting culture, working alongside such music industry veterans as Harley Allen, wow, and Steve Warner. In 2013, she released her first full-length studio album appropriately titled Memories of Mine. The critically acclaimed record intimately paid homage to the sounds of her youth, exploring the bluegrass, gospel, and old folk songs her grandmother used to sing to her. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. You had quite the journey to get here today, didn't you? Uh, I, I did, but yeah. I'm here and uh, the sun is shining, so uh, all is so well. So far? So yeah. far, all is well. I think we're getting a little more sunshine than where you are in, in Georgia. I believe so, yes. Your childhood seems to be kind of that kind of that perfect mashup of what an Appalachian music lifestyle would be. Is that how you saw it? Uh, at the time, no. But looking back, yes. Um, and it's, I think it's a very common uh, story for a lot of country and roots Americana artists. Um, growing up in the South, going to church on Sundays, and uh, finding yourself, you know, immersed in this hodgepodge of, of old country uh, and, and gospel and folk music. You were somewhat influenced, from what I could tell, by your grandmother. I was largely influenced by my grandmother. Did she have any type of musical ambitions herself? She did. She actually was a gospel singer professionally um, for a while. And uh, they had a group, her and her brother and a cousin and sister-in-law, um, called the Cool Springs Quartet. And the cool, cool Springs was the name of the old uh, country Baptist church where I grew up. But they actually uh, came to Nashville and cut three uh, records back in the you know 60s and 70s and uh, toured around a lot regionally. Um, so I still have those vinyl records wow. at my home. Yeah. In the area that you grew up in, uh, in addition to your grandmother, were there other artists that you listened to? And we chatted a little bit about Amy Lou Harris, but at least the songbook. Were there other artists that you listened to? Oh, my goodness. I listened to anything and everything I could get my hands on. Um, I, I did grow up in a very, um, I would say, religious, you know, Southern Baptist household. So we were in church every Sunday and Wednesday. But my parents never restricted what I listened to. And my dad... I mean, starting from the age of six, Amy Lou Harris was my first concert. Um, and my dad took me there. And through the years, he took me to see Randy Travis and the Judds. I remember meeting Reba McIntyre in an old carpet warehouse in North Georgia, um, which, by the way, side, side note, Dalton, Georgia is the carpet capital of the world, uh, in case you did not know. Right. Um, so um, I remember 
meeting her, they had brought her to town, you know, whatever promoter brought her to town uh, back in the early 80s. And it was a very small venue in this converted old carpet warehouse with the stage. And uh, so I just remember her standing, you know, after the show, signing autographs. And so I met her. And um, so that's a very vivid memory of mine. But the Judds were a huge influence as well. Emily Harris, the Judds, Reba McIntyre, those were three really major influences growing up. But my dad, like I said, he took me to concerts. On a very regular basis, and uh, I saw, you know, Charlie Pride and, uh, you know, all all the big names back in the 80s. So I consider myself very fortunate. You wrote your first song at the age of seven, as your bio states. Did you know what you were doing at that age? I mean, seven years old, I probably didn't know how to put my shoes on correctly. I was bored. Really? (laughs) <laughs> um, my my stepfather was an avid hunter and fisherman, and during hunting season, we were always in South Georgia and on hunting property that he would lease every year, and he would always have to go, you know, and check the salt blocks and you know look for um, tracks and whatnot. And so, hours and hours of riding around in this old jeep, you know, a seven-year-old, you know, six-year-old had to keep herself entertained. So I would sing a lot, and uh, I remember riding, just coming up with this song about my stepdad Donnie on the power line, which is where they hunted a lot. So. Did you have a guitar or anything? Or were you just writing lyrics down and making the melody in your head? So the melody and the lyrics just kind of, you know, came to me. I mean, I'm surprised I still remember it, but I, I remember every word and the melody. It was a very simple melody. Don't ask me to sing it. But seriously, <laughs> seven years old and you still remember that. I do. Wow. I do. How is that? I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't, and that's, I think that that's the magical thing about songwriting, because even... Today, I think about songs that I've written through the years, and it's almost like something wrote it through me. Right. That makes perfect sense. So um, I I often don't know where they come from, but um, I'm thankful when they do. When we talk about you coming to Nashville in 2003, a lot of people know who Steve Warner is. Guy is not only an amazing songwriter, but he's also been an artist in his own right. But at the same time, when we start talking about Harley Allen, I mean, he's written for Garth, Dirks Bentley, Gary Allen, Alan John, Jackson, Alan Jackson, John Conley, mm-hmm. uh, just the, the list goes on forever and ever. How did that connection come about? Because this is Nashville. There's a lot of aspiring songwriters. How do you connect with a legend like that? You know what? I'm not even really sure where I first met Harley. I really cannot recall the exact moment that we met. We did have a lot of mutual friends that we seemed to, you know, have in common at the time. But I remember, you know, going to a few songwriters nights and and he would be there actually watching a friend of mine. And then, you know, we became acquainted then. But again, I can't tell you the exact moment, but he just really, he really liked uh, my voice. And at the time, he knew that my songwriting was very uh, elementary, we'll say, because I was just learning that or starting to really delve into it. I, you know, I did write my first song at seven, but then uh, many, many years went by. And uh, I think, you know, you just grow up and then um, you kind of forget, you know, some of those things, I guess, or and you, you have other interests in middle school and high school and whatnot. Um, but I quickly learned when I came to Nashville that the way to get my voice heard was to write my own songs, to do writer's nights. And uh, so I think he saw something in me because he did kind of um, take me in a little bit and mentor. Um, have We had a few co-writing sessions. I still have the work tapes at home um, of those. And uh, I, I want to finish, uh, you know, some of those songs. Eventually, he's no longer with us. So he just, he had me do some demo work for him and Steve in the studio. So that's how I met Steve was through Harley. But he just really encouraged me to always write. Uh, He told me, I'll never forget it. He said, you know, the, the fame will come and go but you can always write. And at a young, you know, 20-something-year-old, I was like, Psh, 
whatever, I'm going to be famous and I'm going to do this and that. Who cares about writing so much? But now that I'm older, I realize what um, a gem of, of knowledge that was. And so I hold that very dear these days. And uh, I think that's what has kind of kept me uh, in some part doing what I, I do and to just keep writing no matter what or where I find myself. When we talk about songwriting, did you find it easier for you to be that solo songwriter or to do co-writes? I mean, once again, we talk about Harley Allen and we talk about Steve Warner, which are two of the legends in the business. Um, When you finally started songwriting, were you doing it on your own or were you collaborating with others? Both. Yeah. When I first started, I was writing all the time. And I I was also um, kind of, you know, upping my chops on guitar because I did play a few chords. I'd say, you know, three chords in the truth when I started. But again, moving to Nashville, you know, the bar gets raised. So um, I wanted to be better. So I started taking guitar lessons from a, a gentleman at Belmont. And I just wrote every chance I had. So sometimes that was just at my apartment you know, alone. And sometimes as much as I could, I would co-write with others. I will say, though, that the more I've, I've done, the more I've written, uh, the more I prefer, by and large, to write on my own. But uh, given the opportunity, and sometimes, you know, the stars align and you have a really good co-writing session. Uh, but by and large, I find that I'm much more uninhibited when I'm writing alone. What do you like to write about? What are your songs made up of? So I like to be truthful when I write. That's nice. <laughs> so writing has, through the years, been a sort of therapy. Okay. Um, so I find that um, it is cathartic. It's great just to get your feelings, whatever they are, out on paper or into the world. But so often when I write, it's a reflection, you know, of what is going on internally. But I also like to write about stories that maybe that friends have told me or family members. For instance, the title track of my newest album, Scars of Mine, is a song I wrote about my grandmother. And it's based on the stories she would tell me as a young child of her childhood growing up. So inspiration for me for for songs can come from really anywhere. I'd say observation, whether that be my life, someone else's life, or sometimes you're just walking down the road and an idea, like I said, kind of drops out of, you know, the skies and you're like, oh, what what is that? And then you just kind of follow that down the rabbit hole. As a songwriter, do you find yourself sometimes in the middle of the night sleeping, you wake up and you have an idea and you write it down? Honestly, Well, there have been a couple of times where I've had ideas in my sleep and I get up and, you know, I I make a song of it. I will say that more often than not, uh, morning times are my quiet time. And that is when, you know, I get the most ideas um, or inspiration or on walks. But I will say as a, a person who has learned to value their mental health through the years. I do try to not get overstimulated at night in the creative process, if that makes sense. Do you find that as a hindrance or as a positive? Which which one? What do you mean? Not the, the overstimulation when you're trying to, to rest, but maybe you have that idea in your head for a song. If I have an idea that's really, you know, I'd say nagging at me, I, I will get it down. I, I like I, that. You have something that's nagging at you. Yeah. You, you just can't shake it off. Right. And, and luckily, we have these devices that are always by our side. Right. These days. That unfortunately. You, <laughs> fortunately or unfo- yeah. sometimes fortunately. Right. Because, you know, through the years, probably a lot of people lost a lot of melodies because they didn't have a way to record themselves at the time. So I just say, you know, seeing the melody, maybe it's just a melody that I'm hearing, or maybe it's a phrase that I think of, and I will write it down on my little, you know, notes in the app, um, or I will sing what I'm I'm hearing, and and I'll do it that way. And that way, I know that it's there and that I can come back to it. So that way, I can let it go a little easier, knowing that it'll be it'll be there for me. We're going to take a break, get a word in for a couple of our sponsors here. When we come back, we're going to have some more conversation with Charles E. Etheridge. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Larry Butler, and I want to send you a free digital copy of my new book, The Singer-Songwriter Rulebook, 101 Ways to Help You Improve Your Chances of Success. That's right. Everything you need to know to launch your career as a singer-songwriter, all based on my 40 years in the live performance arena. And believe me, I've seen it all. In my book, you'll find the 10 things you have to deal with before even thinking about becoming a singer-songwriter-performer. You'll also learn about the five things every singer-songwriter can do this weekend to make their live show better. Five things I can guarantee that you are not doing already. Plus, there's tips on songwriting and staging, photo and video shoots, publishing, merch, dozens of other topics, all written for people who don't particularly like to read. And again, it's free. Just go to the Business Side of Music website homepage and look for my book cover. Click on it, and a free digital copy of my book will be yours. I'm Larry Butler, and I approve of this message. Thanks. Whether you consider yourself a musician or not, music is all around us, and it affects our everyday lives, whether it's background music influencing our shopping habits in a store, organ music adding the vibe to a baseball game, or a playlist convincing us to keep going on that last mile of a run. I'm Mindy Peterson, host of the podcast Enhanced Life with Music, where we take a holistic look at music's benefits through the lens of science and medicine, entertainment, and business. You can find me and Enhanced Life with Music at mpetersonmusic.com slash podcast or wherever you get your audio. You're listening to the business side of music. Back in the studio, Charles E. Etheridge is sitting across the podcast table here in Nashville, Tennessee. We talked about your first album that you released in 2013, Memories of Mine. You also have a Christmas album that came out 2021. Well, it's a five-song five EP. Yes, five-song EP that I uh, did with Jack Pearson, guitar player that some people may have heard of. Was this a, a culmination of Christmas music, holiday music that you wanted to put out? When Jack and I recorded this, it was a few years back. And I was actually taking slide guitar lessons from him at the time. I met Jack when I first moved to Nashville, uh, 2003, 2004. And so I had known who he was and really enjoyed going to see him play um, through the years. And then I got a resonator guitar for Christmas one year. And I was like, gosh, I need to take lessons from someone. So I was at one of his shows at Third and Lindsley and I... I just said, hey, Jack, do you know someone, you know, that would, you would recommend to teach? And I certainly didn't expect him to say, I'll do it, but he did. And so I, I warned him that I was very, very beginner uh, at slide guitar that I did not know what I was doing. But he was the most patient teacher I have ever had in my life, uh, which is amazing because he's also one of the best guitar players, I think, on the planet. But he would um, just sit there and just make me, you know, do these licks over and over and over and over and over. And I'm going, are you not about bored out of your mind? (laughs) But he was very patient, very gracious. He's a great person. So I ended up doing some studio work from him for him during that time, uh, singing some demos for him. And uh, I performed with him, uh, did some background vocals, you know, some of his shows here in Nashville. And we were honestly just sitting around one day and I said, you know, I'd like to have a little Christmas thing to, you know, hand out at my shows or whatnot. And we just sat down literally with a mic and he mic'd his guitar and we just played and sang these songs. And I thought it came out beautifully. And so I decided to release it so the public could enjoy. Its title is An Acoustic Christmas with Charles E. and Jack. Those five songs... A lot of times when you talk to singer-songwriters who are putting a project out, that whole decision process of choosing what you're going to record and release, these songs originals, these songs contemporary covers, old traditionals. So these songs on the Christmas album are more traditional Christmas tunes. Most people will know we had a we have a couple of gospel tunes um, like and now I can I remember Silent Night. So I think most people 
Right, know can that sing tune. along exactly. with Exactly, yeah. right. But then we also did a version of Beautiful Star of Bethlehem, which was um, my other grandmother on my, on my father's side. It was her favorite Christmas song. And so that's a song that I would sing every year at Christmas, sitting around in her living room. And so I did want to do that for her. Right. Um, and of course, that was written here in Tennessee. I can't remember what year. But uh, so and then the others, um, just Christmas songs that I really enjoy singing. So was this a duet project or did you have a full band? No, it was just Jack and myself. Wow. So it's just he just sat down and played the guitar and just pretty much came up with these arrangements off the top of his head, uh, which they're beautiful. And uh, so I just he's so easy to to play and sing with. I definitely feel that my time working with him made me a much better musician. And you have a new album coming out now that's going to be released September 29th. 29th. You told me that. Titled Scars of Mine. Let's talk about that project. How did that all come about? So that project came about because, like I said, I had been writing for many years. And then I realized, goodness, I I really don't have any quality recordings of this. I had a lot of work tapes and some kind of demo projects, but I had not released an entire album of all original music. And so um, a good friend of mine, Jerry Navarro, uh, he's a bass player. He used to be part of the Music Mafia back in the day with Big and Rich and Gretchen Wilson and all that. He was opening a studio in Franklin, Indiana. Well, I thought it was in Franklin, Tennessee. So I was like, hey, Jerry, uh, I would love to come out, you know, and, and lay down three or four tracks. And so then he's like, that'd be great. I'd love to have you. But, you know, I'm in Indiana now and not Tennessee. And so a little bit of a difference, a little there. bit of a difference yeah. there. And so it, it almost didn't happen. But he said, look, I'm having a few other people, you know, come and record. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring some of my Nashville players up to Indiana he said, I would love to have you for the week. So basically, it was like a little music camp. So for one week, myself and um, some of my friends from Nashville and Jerry, we were all up in Indiana. And we just pretty much recorded for five days straight. And uh, we did a show at the local theater uh, in, in, in Franklin, Indiana. And um, the finished project is Scars of Mine, the album. When you went into the studio to record, all the songs were completed at that point, or were some of them still a work in progress? No, they were all completed, but it did what I I thought we were going to be doing, three or four tracks, you know, in the weeks leading up to this. Jerry said, you know, Charlesy, I really think we're going to have enough time to do an entire record if you want to do that project. And so I said, well, hey, I have the song, so why not? So we did. And so we went into the studio, and um, they they were all finished. Jerry was going to kind of take the lead on the project, but then what ended up happening was Pat Bergeson ended up being hired onto the project. He's a great guitarist and harmonica player, and Chet Atkins brought him to Nashville back in the 80s, and uh, he also played with Susie Boggess for a long time, and he, he's just a, a very respected individual as well in the music business, or you know the music industry. And he and I had been friends for quite some time as well. And we just kind of really, you know, hit it off in the studio. And so he ended up becoming the producer of the project. When you start putting those songs together, and obviously you've written them, you have a a basic foundation. Is there much of a transition that takes place in the studio when you first start recording? Okay, well, here's the song, but let's try this or let's maybe go down that path. Did that seem to happen? So there was one track in particular where that happened and there are two versions of this one song on the album because of that very reason wow (laughs) which i know doesn't happen very often but i'm a little stubborn yeah so how (laughs) do they how do they differ from each other so it's very very interesting because it's, it's the song called midnight train and it was written as a ballad and when we got in the studio the guys just said, you know, let's try this with a little more movement. And so and the tempo actually stayed the same. When you listen to the tracks, you wouldn't think that. But actually, the two tempos are exactly the same. The only thing is diff- that is different is just the percussive drive 
in, in the bass and you know the, the drums. But that changes the whole. It color changes of the, the whole thing. So it does feel like this kind of train, you know, just like trucking down the tracks, yeah. you know, and it, this movement throughout the whole song, which it ended up being a great track. But again, because it was written as a ballad, I had to do something that I felt really represented how I intended it to be. And so the bonus track is Midnight Train, just with a piano and guitar. So I, I have to ask you, you know, as a songwriter, you give birth to your songs, much like when having children. Of those two renditions, <laughs> she knows what I'm going to ask here. <laughs> Is there a favorite? Is there the favorite child of the two? I think that my personal preference is how it was was written. I think that commercially, the full band track with more movement is definitely commercial friendly. Yeah. Um, but my personal favorite, if I'm going to sing it in a show, it's going to be me and a piano. We're going to take a break. Get a word in for a couple more of our sponsors, and when we come back, we're going to have some more conversation with Charles Etheridge. You're listening to the business side of music. Hey, this is Jack Sharkey, host of the Between the Notes podcast. Are you a music fan? Do you still get a thrill from your favorite songs? Are you curious about the history, development, and tech behind it all? Well, then join us each week as we explore that and more on the Between the Notes podcast. Check us out on Facebook at Podcast Between the Notes and find us everywhere you get your podcasts. As a musician, you have a dream, that vision of what success looks like for you. Though it's not only about the money, money is part of it. Whether you've been extremely successful or you're just striving to maintain a regular cash flow, you need a plan. Money Concepts can help you develop a customized plan to achieve the financial stability and success you want. For over 40 years, Money Concepts has been providing holistic financial planning services to individuals, families, and business owners. As an independent firm, Money Concepts and their associates are committed to always represent the best interest of the client. It's really about a committed, benevolent interest in them personally. This independence coupled with that committed, benevolent interest means they represent you, the client, not a product supplier. It's not about selling products, it's about helping you achieve success. To learn how this can benefit you, contact my buddy, John Adams, with Money Concepts at 737-867-9309. That's 737-867-9309. You can also email John at jadams at moneyconcepts.com. You're listening to the business side of music. Nashville, Tennessee, back in Music Dog Studios. And there's a reason we call it Music Dog Studios, in case you haven't figured it out. And people that watch our YouTube webcasts will notice shadows passing along every once in a while, or they'll, the, they'll hear the click, click, click. And, and that's Buddy, the Music Dog, that uh, seems to wander his way into the studio in spite of our best intentions. Uh, but Charles E. Etheridge is sitting across the podcast table I want to kind of wrap things up by asking you, now that you've done all this, and this is your career of choice, is it everything that you thought it would be? More, less so? Oh, goodness, that's a loaded question. Well, we like to ask loaded <laughs> questions. <laughs> it is nothing like I thought it would be. Really? Yeah. Okay, so what? Did it not be that you were hoping it would be or vice versa? So I think that there is this huge, and I say that it's nothing like I thought it would be thinking about this as my seven-year-old self or even 17 or 27-year-old self. You have these visions, you know, you see people on TV, uh, you hear them on the radio, and you think, gosh, they live such a privileged life. But really, it is, you know, it's kind of just just what you do and who you are. Um, so I would say not much changes 
uh, from day to day? Like you, you get up in the morning and, and you write these songs and, you know, some days you're lucky enough to be able to go into the studio and record. And then sometimes you get the call that, oh, yeah, your song's going to be on this radio station or whatnot. But you just have to kind of realize that life is still there to be lived, you know? Life is life. Life is life. Yeah. And so this is just one part of it. A big part of it, but um, yeah. it's very different than, again, what, what people think. I mean, people are still people. Musicians are still people. Stars are still people, right? I think sometimes we underappreciate that or underestimate when we talk about celebrities. And I think anybody that's on a stage performing live in front of whether it's 12 people or 12,000 people, you're still a celebrity uh, of sorts some, somewhere in that dynamic. Sure. But at the same time, you're still a human being that has feelings and emotions and energy that you're trying to channel in a positive way. That's right. Going ahead in your career, what have you plotted a roadmap for you at this point of what you want to see happen next? I mean, you've got the album coming out on the 29th of September, mm -hmm. Scars of Mine. I do. Do you have a, a, a course that you're looking to take? First of all, uh, you know, getting this album out to as many people as we possibly can. Um, so with this album, I've been fortunate enough to make some more, um, I would say, connections and um, people working in my corner right. uh, to hopefully uh, get this into the hands and ears of, of more people. So we'll see how that that goes. Um, I'm all honestly my, my next kind of order of business. Uh, not to put this album, not to take anything away from it, but I've already started writing what will be my next record. So I've, I'm already ready to get back in the studio, honestly. But that's a question I, I would want to ask anyway, is you really don't stop writing at any point. It's always that creative process. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, because a lot a lot of time passes between when something gets recorded and then people yes. get to hear it. Yeah. So you have a lot of space to fill, you know, and what are you doing during that time? I mean, obviously you're getting ready. You know, there's a lot that goes into, you know, you've got your, you know, promotion and photo shoots and whatnot um, and getting ready to release your singles. But... Again, going on to the yeah, kind of day-to-day -day life, you know. As we said earlier, life is life. Life is life. Yeah. And so what do I do, you know, with that time? And I, I use that time to create, yeah. right? And um, so, you know, my morning, you know, with my tea or whatnot, I have a little journal and I, I start, you know, jotting things down. And some of those end up, you know, songs. Becoming the next project. That's right. Yeah. So it's just this big you know, circle yeah. just keeps on going. And at some point you hope that, you know, what you're doing connects with people. And like you said, even, you know, if it's two people, 20 people, 2,000, 2 million people, um, if you are creating and someone is connecting to what you're doing, then I think that it's worthwhile. And touching one life, you don't know what kind of a change you make into those people. Sure. Yeah. How can our listeners find out about you? CharlesyEtheridge.com is my website. There aren't too many Charlesy Etheridges out in the world. So if you start, you know, putting in any variation of that name, you're probably going to find me. Um, so Charlesy Etheridge. Dot com is my website. I'm also on Facebook or Instagram. I haven't hopped into TikTok very much. That's but okay. I haven't maybe either. One day. So yeah. <laughs> And how can they find your music? So everywhere that all the popular download platforms, streaming platforms, you know, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, whatever their preferred method is, YouTube Music, you can find me there. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. The business side of music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. The business side of music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Buson.